Check one, two. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship. Welcome to St. Luke Joy. It's a beautiful, beautiful morning, actually, to be together and not have the sun beating down on us too hard. So invite your friends, invite someone you may know who lives close by to come, come join us this morning. It's a wonderful day to be alive and to be happy in the Lord. Because we know that God holds all things together for those who love him. He's the center of all we do. He's the center of our worship this morning. And so I'm just super uh, excited to see you all, see your faces, and to continue to be in touch with you. Let's continue to be the church and reach out to one another as best we can. Thank you for being flexible kind of with the schedule and being flexible right now with how things are in the world. Uh, we're going to keep on keeping on. We know the Lord is doing something among us. And we're going to be better because of it. I, I believe, and I, I, I'm not saying this is any direct revelation or not, but I do believe that we are heading into the golden age in many ways of what the church can be. Things are going to be different, but I think it's always going to be for the better. And the Lord is pruning us, and he's getting us outside the walls, and he's doing mighty things among us. And the church is going to be only stronger and stronger because of what we're going through. So... Be encouraged. Be encouraged this morning. Just a few things of announcement-wise. Uh, we do have a congregational meeting coming up on the 16th of this month. We encourage you all to be there. Uh, it's going to be a great opportunity for us to continue to kind of circle the wagons and talk about where we're headed, where we're going. Uh, we are going to be having, you might have seen in the uh, Joyful Journal, that we're going to be having several meetings and congregational meetings this fall that we want you to all be a part of. The session is calling specifically for this. Starting with the congregational meeting on the 16th, there's going to be a town hall uh, every month until Christmas, which we're inviting you. We will be, we'll, we're going to meet outside for the congregational meeting this month, but the there's going to be a town hall in September as well. And that's going to be in the fellowship hall, but we're also going to Zoom that so people can attend online if they need to. But really the town hall's uh, idea is to bring as many people as we can as congregation more onto the discussion as to where we're going with our new mission, our new vision, and where we're going with uh, the replant of the church. So that'll be a great opportunity starting on the 16th to begin to ask questions, um, lean in. We, you know, apologize that we, we were planning on doing this back in March, but obviously the virus has made that more and more difficult. So we have, uh, we're just slowing things down and we're going to do it together as a family and we're going to get there as best we can. But the Lord is doing great things and we're so excited to share with you as a session more about that vision and mission that we talk about every week. So put on your calendar, those dates are in the Joyful Journal. I will also email them out and send them out by letter this week, but please uh, put those on your calendar. They will be most Sundays, and uh, we've done as best we can. I think the majority of all those dates, all of them, avoid uh, overlapping with any Chiefs games as well, so we should be able to have as many people as we, we can at those town halls. Uh, the one in September is where we're also going to be inviting in a presbytery representative uh, to also answer some questions for you as well and to help uh, understand kind of what we're doing. So just looking forward to those family conversations with you all. But that being said, let's pray and begin worship. Heavenly Father, we, we love you and praise you. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for this wonderful weather. And God, we pray that your words would be spoken this morning, that they would uh, leave this place through these microphones or through this parking lot and go into the world, and you would send us as ambassadors each to our own family and to our own context. God, revive us, refresh us, encourage us this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join me in reaffirming our mission and vision this morning. What is the mission of our church? Our, our mission, mission is, is to know Christ, Christ becoming, becoming like, like him, him for, for the, the glory of God. God. What is the vision of our church? Our, our vision, vision is to be a to church, church to our, our community, community that, that preaches the good news of Jesus Christ, serves, serves the needs of our neighbors, and empowers disciples to make disciples. 
Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 7. Lord my God, I take refuge in you. Save and deliver me from all who pursue me. Arise, Lord, in your anger. Rise up against the rage of my enemies. Awake, my God, decree justice. Let the assembled peoples gather around you while you sit enthroned over them on high. Let the Lord judge the peoples. Vindicate me, Lord, according to my righteousness, according to my integrity, O Most High. Bring to an end the violence of the wicked and make the righteous secure, you, the righteous God, who probes minds and hearts. My shield is God Most High, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge. I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. I will sing the praises of the name of the Lord Most High. Let us, Let us worship, worship God. God. Let us begin worshiping God. But read about the very God whom we have just talked about. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead and ascended to heaven. And is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing Holy, Holy, Holy. Um, I apologize, Ted and Julia, for those of you that are not here this morning, because Julia has, has come down with um, some stomach sickness. So be praying for them as well. Uh, we're, we're sorry not to have them. So what we're going to do our best is to sing loud and proud about our God. All right, let's sing.
sin from Psalms 32 verses 1 through 6. It says, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. But then I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover it up. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while it may be found. Beloved, maybe you feel that way, that you've been groaning, and that your sin is pressing up against you, and that you feel lost. But beloved, our Father is standing at the door. His compassions, they fail not. So therefore, let's bring our sins, and what's holding us back, what's separating us from the love of God to him now in this silent time of confession. Let's pray. Lord God, we look to the cross this morning and we are so thankful for your body and for your blood that allows us, Lord, to be righteous in your sight and allows us to be forgiven and come to you, Lord God, knowing our sins are forgiven because of the blood of Jesus. And we claim that this morning and we ask to be forgiven, Father. Lord, you hear our hearts. You hear each and one of us, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you would speak to us this morning and renew us by this holy power, Lord, and assure us, God, of your spirit here with us this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Romans 10, 10 through 13 says this, beloved, be assured of your forgiveness, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts Say that again. Anyone put to shame. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We're going to sing this song. We've only sang it maybe once before. It's called Come to the Altar. It's very simple. A song about how we have the ability to now come before our Father. and He's calling us. He's to the altar. Jesus is 
Let's go to a time of prayer to our Father. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you on this beautiful morning that you have made, Lord, and we rejoice in it. This is the day you have made. Yahweh has made it. Therefore, we will rejoice and be glad. Lord God, we invite you here. We know you are with us, Lord, but we do open our hearts to you. Lord, I pray that you would burn away and remove, Lord, any obstacle within us, Father, within our hearts that is keeping us from posturing ourselves, Lord, rightly before you in worship this morning. Lord God, we do worship you, and I pray for this congregation that they would be encouraged, Lord. We know that you are on the move all around us, where there's no winter, no virus, no sin, Lord, that keeps you away, Father. There's no tragedy that keeps you away. Lord God, you will continue to work, and we thank you for that, and we praise you for that. And Lord, we want to be a part of it, Father. We see your hand Lord, we see what you're doing around the world. And Lord, this church is, is jealous for your glory. Lord, we desire to be a part of what you're doing and to join you in, in your work, Father, and in the advancing kingdom. 
Therefore, God, purify us from all unrighteousness. Lord, may we focus our eyes and the eyes of our hearts, our whole being, Lord, on your cross and its victory and what the cross is doing, Lord, and the message of your Son, Jesus Christ, and him crucified and hope in his name, what that's doing, Lord, and what's, that, what's that's done, doing, and will yet to do, Father, for us. Such a powerful thing you have given us, Lord, to parade in your world, the cross of Christ. And Father, we do pray for our nation. We pray for our first responders. You would protect them. Lord, we pray for reconciliation. First and foremost to you, Father, and then to our brothers and sisters. No matter who they are, where they're from, God, we pray for reconciliation. May the church rise up in this moment, God. Show the church that this is our moment. Lord, we do know that it's always been the church's moment, but Lord, when the stocks are down, when things are in chaos, Father, you bring hope and you bring security. You bring stability through the name of Jesus. Lord God, we long to bring that message to the places of chaos. Lord God, the cross is the antidote to chaos. We thank you for that antidote, Father, through the blood of Jesus, the body, and the blood. Lord God, show us how we can continuously build relationships, Lord, with those who do not know you. Build relationships with our families, with our neighbors, and with this community, Lord, Glenhaven and beyond, the Northland, Kansas City North, Father, we, we desire to see revival. So Holy Spirit, fall. Fall on us. Renew us. Lord, we need a fresh understanding of Pentecost and what that meant, Lord. We need a fresh understanding of urgency. Lord, give us unction. Give us courage and boldness to proclaim, Lord, to wherever it is that you would have us go, whether it's just in our homes. Lord, may we start with that one step. That's enough for us, Father, that one step. Lord, just reveal the path before us. But we do pray, Lord, that you would give the same calling and the same will to our leaders and those that we are under their authority, Father, our mayor, our commissioners, our senators, representatives, Father, our president. Lord God, work your will through all of this, Lord, what seems like chaos. We know you are among it. And you will not be thwarted, Father, by anything. So we praise you. And Lord God, we do pray for this congregation, Lord. I said pray for their encouragement. And I pray for any soul that is here who does not know you, that today would be the day. Lord, reach out through your Holy Spirit to anyone here who does not truly know you. Anyone's family member here, Lord. Anyone listening to this on the live stream, Lord. Anyone who does not know you, may today be the day they hear the gospel clearly. Lord, help this pastor not to muddy it. Not to get in the way of it, Father, but only to show the scripture as it really is and what you would really have it say to us. So this morning, Lord, we pray for Pat Pearl. Pray for Phyllis Carpiers. Lord, I ask you to continue to heal them, be with them, encourage them as they go through struggles. Lord, you know them. Pray for Dwight Sampson, Father. You would be with him, be with his back and his legs and his family. Give him peace and rest, Lord, from the pain. Pray for those in the military, Lord, that you would protect them, give them courage and peace. Pray for our healthcare workers, those who are in the line, Lord, of virus and all kinds of other issues. Lord, those working, our counselors and our chaplains, Father, working with those that are struggling, Lord, with substance abuse, Lord, that has skyrocketed during this time. You know it, Father. Give them the words and all you can have. Rise up more leaders, God, to re reach that need. All of our public servants, social workers, God, work with them, use them, send divine uh, send divine appointments, Lord, of other Christians into their life. Pray for the family of Joanne Tobias for healing and comfort. We pray for Marsha Bush and Bob Bush, Lord. We thank you for their ministry and for their lives. Pray for their children, for Peggy and for Ken. For positive results, Lord, and healing in the name of Jesus. Pray for Dodie Rayo, Lord, who's been struggling with pain Lord, continue to heal her and give her good days and may Dodie and Rich, Lord, draw closer and closer to you in this time. Pray for John and Sue Crawl, Lord God. I pray for John that he would 
have be comforted, Father, and be well taken care of, and pray for Sue, Lord, you'd bring people continuously to help her with this trial, Father. Lord, encourage them, encourage their whole family, bring them peace in the name of Jesus. Pray for Darlene Lewis, Lord, that you would be with her and encourage her. Show her your love and your spirit rest on her and heal her knee, Father. And God, we praise you for what you're doing in John Sullivan's life, Lord. We pray for good results, Lord. We praise you that he was able, Lord, to continue to fight this battle. And we're thankful, Lord, that we're hopefully seeing the end of certain treatments, God. But we do pray for a successful surgery coming up for John. Encouragement, Father. Bring him encouragement. Bring him peace and comfort. Or be with Cass as well, Lord, as she supports John. Give them strength, Lord, and endurance for the battle. Pray for Debbie and Kent Blackman and their son, Kenny. Continuously, Lord, give them health and strength. Pray for Gary Burns. Continuously, Lord, that he would find Jesus. We pray for Don and Jan Smith, Lord God. We praise you for what you're doing in Jan's life. Thank you for their endurance, Lord, all these years. For their courage, Lord God, continue to heal Jan. Take away her pain in the name of Jesus. And the same for Don, Father. Give him encouragement. Bring peace to them. Rest upon them. Pray for Joe Palakatel, Lord. Heal Joe continuously. Be with his ministry. And we also continue to pray for the Daniels family. And for their children, Lord, who are struggling. Lord, you know what's going on there. Heal and encourage. And we also pray for Julia Horowitz. If you would heal her this morning, Lord, and Ted. Be with her, watch over her, in the name of Jesus. In all these things, Lord, we pray in your wonderful name. Thank you for teaching us how to pray these words, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, just a reminder this morning uh, that we are going to be uh, taking communion together. So if you have not received your communion when that time comes, Please uh, wave your hand and our, one of our deacons will get to you. Also, just a reminder um, that if you have any, if you would like to give to the church, um, you can also give that to the deacons as well. They'll have a bucket for that. They usually go around during our second song. I apologize that I don't always bring that up. But we just thank you so much for your, your gifts to the church, particularly during this difficult time. Well, once again, welcome, St. Luke Joy. My name is Pastor Luke. If you don't know me or you're visiting with us today, we're so happy to have you. And welcome to those that are watching on the live stream as well, which is great. I'm very happy for technology. I was just thinking to myself, imagine if we were going through this pandemic just even 10 years ago. It would have been a very different story and what we're able to do with live streaming and Zoom and all the different kind of different things. So I'm very grateful for that, grateful that we have some level of connection or it would be very difficult. But we know the Lord will always provide, and he sees our needs. Well, this morning, we're back in Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. This passage aligns uh, in a wonderful way with what we went through last week. It was a challenging passage for those of you that might have read it, because there's a lot to it, and there's a lot going on. So I'm excited to dive into it with you, but I encourage you, uh, to get out your Bibles, follow along. Please take notes in your Bible or next to them and bring them to the open table. Once again, I'm going to keep inviting that. We're going to keep, the open table is going to continuously, even once on, when we're stopped meeting online and when we meet in the church, it's just a great opportunity for you to take notes, write questions, anything that you might need uh, or have anything you want answered or insights that you might have. That's one of the main things we do at open tables. I will ask how is God speaking to you through this passage? And then, of course, we always try to ask at the open table at the end, what then do we do about it? Okay? So don't just be people, as James says, who hear the word as if you look in the mirror and forget what you look like. If we don't write things down, 
or ask questions or engage in conversation and use that other part of our brain instead of just listening, we will forget things. So, and we understand that. So please take notes and engage in conversation and try to follow and ask questions. Um, we don't want this to be a place that doesn't approach the whys or the hows or what's that about. Nothing is put under the rug here when it comes to the Word of God because we believe the Word of God is strong, powerful, and authoritative. With that being said, let's dive into the passage. Mark chapter 7, verse 24 through 30. Hear now the Word of the Lord. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syria. Syrian, born in Syria. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, said Jesus, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. The word of the Lord. Our first question when approaching this passage is why Tyre, and of course why Sidon, earliest manuscripts of this passage point out that Jesus actually visited both cities, Tyre and Sidon. And if, you, if we had the PowerPoint up, I'd show you a map. You can kind of think of Israel where it is right up against the Mediterranean Sea. Tyre and Sidon are nice little coastal cities on the north part of uh, Israel. So the earliest manuscripts point out that he visited both of these seaside Gentile cities. And they're actually in, you know, we think of Israel, but they're in present-day Lebanon. There are only a few reasons we can assume from the text that Jesus went to these cities. Because this would have been a far, another long journey for him out of the way of where he was already ministering in Galilee. So this is an important piece. One thought was that Jesus was looking to get himself and the disciples away from all the action in Galilee. As we saw chapter after chapter, verse after verse, there were things happening. He was getting very little rest. He was involved in one thing after another. This would possibly explain the end of verse 24 where it says he did not want anyone to know that he was in this area. Second reason he could have gone to this place was he could have been avoiding Galilee for their safety's sake. We just read about the political climate with the death of John the Baptist by Herod Antipas. And thirdly, and I think possibly the best explanation as to why Jesus went to Tyre and Sidon, is he wanted to teach the disciples once again a lesson on true faith. So it's probably a mixture of these three reasons, but I do think every time Jesus goes somewhere, there's a greater reason behind it. He knows. There's no avoiding the parallel between this story and verses 1 through 23 in chapter 7 involving the Pharisees, as we read about last week. We just read that the religious elite, those who should understand Jesus' message, were caught up in traditions and failed to see Jesus as he really is. The people of God, the ones Jesus was sent to directly, were struggling to understand his message. Even his disciples were struggling to understand. They were caught up in prestige and pride and legalism. Remember this. Remember that. They were caught up in prestige and pride and legalism. Jesus preached a loud and clear statement from last time in verses 14 through 15. He said, it says, Jesus called to the crowd loudly. He said, listen to me. Everyone, listen to me and understand this. Nothing comes out of a person defiles them. I mean, nothing outside of a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. Right? We talked about how it comes out from the heart. The apparent lesson from this is that if food is not unclean in and of itself, then neither are people. The truth carries over into these verses 24 through 30. I think, therefore, today's passage is one of the most substantial pieces of foreshadowing 
for the coming apostolic church, as we see in the book of Acts. It is reasonable to suspect, once again, knowing Mark's gospel, his source came from Peter, who later, with his experience with Cornelius in Acts 10, reinforced the truth of this encounter. Peter says this later after Pentecost in Acts, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. Acts 10, verse 34 to 35. Therefore, it would seem ideal for Mark, hearing from Peter, to follow up this story from verses 1 through 23 with the going over to a Gentile region, Tyre and Sidon, after just being denied by the people who were meant to hear the word, the Pharisees. Matthew's gospel follows the same train of events. This is an essential piece of context to remember as we progress in this passage. Understanding the context of Tyre and Sidon as cities is also helpful. It reinforces the actions of Jesus. Tyre and Sidon were not any minor Gentile cities. These cities were seen by the people of Israel, the people of God, for many, many years as prime areas of corruption, extreme pagan worship, and depravity. The region of Tyre had been the home of Jezebel. You remember her from Elijah's day? She had nearly ruined the northern kingdom with her pagan prophets and practices. It says in 1 Kings chapter 16. During the intermediate intertestamental periods between the Old and New Testament, there was the Maccabean revolt in the second century. Tyre, along with Sidon, fought with the Seleucids against the Jews. The prophets constantly decry Tyre's wealth, wickedness, and terror in Ezekiel 26 and in Zechariah 9. All this and more is what led Jewish historian Josephus to conclude the inhabitants of Tyre and Sidon as notoriously our bitterest enemies. And of course, where does Jesus go? Tyre and Sidon. It is for this reason that I do not believe Jesus merely ventured into the region for a vacation or a sabbatical. There's other places he could have gone, for sure. Jesus, in typical Jesus fashion, was aware of the lesson yet to be taught. This was a statement. Of course, he is immediately recognized, <laughs> which goes to show his level of current fame, and it's hard to hide a Jewish rabbi and his 12 disciples in a notorious Gentile area, so he probably would have stuck out with his tassels like a thor sore thumb. Matthew's gospel gives us more detail about the Greek woman who recognized Jesus. It says Jesus did not answer her. She immediately recognizes him, immediately chases after Jesus. Jesus did not recognize her, it says in Matthew. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, please. <laughs> she keeps crying on after us. This whole being an anonymous thing is not working out. Matthew 15, 23. This woman was not going to take the silence from Jesus as an answer. So Mark tells us, how does Jesus eventually reply? He turns to the woman, he says, first let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. What's her response? Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs, verse 27 to 28. Matthew's gospel states essentially the same thing, but specifies Jesus, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Verse 24. Jesus answers with a loaded statement. He remains faithful first to his primary mission for preaching. To restore the tribes of Jacob, Isaiah 49. And then become a light to the Gentiles, as it says in Isaiah 61. Paul reaffirms this primary mission goal in Romans 1 16 it says for I am not ashamed of the gospel that is from Jesus because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes first to the Jew and then to everybody else to the Gentile we have to understand that Jesus was not here being rude or even dismissive after reaffirming his primary call he turns to a familiar parable and what he quotes here is a parable used by the Jews, as a common adage by the Jews, to distinguish between them 
and the Gentiles. The Jews being the true children and the Gentiles being referred to as the dogs. Now, there's no getting around the fact that dog, calling someone a dog, particularly, you know, even today, but particularly then, was very negative. This was an insult of sorts, but I do want to point out that the way Jesus says dog here is diminutive in the Greek. That means it's affectionate, meaning small dog. There is a difference between a street dog and a small dog. It was often kept as a house pet rather than a stray. You know, regardless or not, still a dog, but a dog that actually was in the house, not out in the, in the streets. So it was less blunt, but it was still dog. The woman, though, she understood the context. She knew what he was talking about, knew the kind of affectionate term he was using, and she knew this parable. She probably heard it from people like the Pharisees. This response by Jesus can be entirely understood in my reading and what I what I begun to understand this response from Jesus can be entirely understood as begging the question or ironically it's not a great use in when we're talking about Jesus but playing devil's advocate I know it's a terrible comparison we're talking about Jesus but you get the point I believe that Jesus was using the typical response of the Pharisee in addressing this woman in front of his disciples Remember, Jesus just nailed the Pharisees for being hypocrites. How will this pagan woman, therefore, respond? The disciples were probably ready when, he, when Jesus turned and said, let the children eat. Doesn't go to the dogs first. Right there in that moment, the disciples are probably waiting for some sick comebacks or a fight. You don't just call that to people, especially someone who doesn't necessarily understand your Jewish theology. How does the woman reply? She says, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. First of all, she calls him Lord, showing the highest respect. In Roman society, only Caesar was to be called Lord. She recognized Jesus as a sovereign and containing power and authority. That's important. Not only that, but her response shows her understanding and acceptance of Israel's privilege as God's chosen people. Indeed, she appears to understand the purpose of Israel's Messiah better than Israel does. Let me say that again. Indeed, she appears to understand the purpose of Israel's Messiah better than Israel does and just had, right? Her persistence and trust in the sufficiency and surplus of Jesus gives testimony to the provision God has not only for Israel, but his provision that is abundant enough to provide for one such as herself. When dogs eat crumbs from the table, they do not rob children of their food. They simply eat what is theirs from the surplus of the children. Understanding this, the woman submits her cause entirely to Jesus, and she's not disappointed. For such a reply, Jesus says, you may go. The demons already left your daughter. What an irony. Jesus seeks desperately to teach those around him, his chosen disciples, yet they are dull and uncomprehending. Jesus is reluctant even to speak to a walk-on pagan woman. And after one sentence, she understands from him his mission and therefore receives this wonderful reply, woman, you have great faith, as he says in Matthew 15, talking about the same story. You have great faith. How is this possible? The answer is that the woman is the first person, beloved, to recognize and to hear and understand a parable of Jesus in Mark's gospel. Everyone else, after every parable, every story, there was confusion. But here we actually see a, the first time a person truly gets it. The brief parable of the children and the dogs at the table has disclosed to her the mystery of God's kingdom. She is not distant and aloof, attempting to maintain her position of power and control like the Pharisees did. She does what Jesus commands and those who would receive the kingdom and experience the word of God. 
she enters the parable. Remember we talked about parables and the purpose of parables and how there's a key to a parable and the point of a parable is to draw you in to the story. She immediately recognizes. That's why you, you don't see this woman going, oh, how dare you say that to me? She immediately recognizes that Jesus was using a parable, a common parable, one that you would have heard amongst the Jews. And he's saying, well, uh, you know, you can't steal the food from our table. Is that what is that what you is that what you heard? Is that what the Pharisees heard? She says, "Lord, I know. Lord, I know." But what about the crumbs? She does what Jesus commands. She enters the parable and allows herself to be claimed by it. She receives the word of Jesus in faith, and therefore becomes a child of God. A true Israelite looks like this. Martin Luther, in his commentary, said, this woman took Christ at his word. He then treated her not as a dog, but as a child of Israel. Do you see how profound this story is? In essence, she said, yes, Lord, I understand. I have no prior claim for your mercy. I am not numbered among your children. I have no right to sit at your table and to feast on the food that you set before your children. I do not want that. I'm satisfied, Lord, with the crumbs. All I'm asking is that you will let me have one crumb from your table. Then I'll be satisfied. Do you see the comparison and the difference between this woman and the Pharisee in verses 1 through 23? This woman did not attempt to defend herself her rights, or her dignity. She knew who she was. Often in the Bible, when people come before a living God, the living God, they identify themselves with the lowest form of life. Even King David in Psalm 23 said, I am a worm and not a man. He was saying, I have no claim on the sweetness of your grace. Every crumb that you bestow on me is given to an unworthy servant. The woman here was adopting that same posture, which is the only proper posture for anyone coming to an almighty God. The good news, beloved, is that in the overflow of mercy and grace that comes to us from the hands of God, though we should be satisfied with the crumbs, He is not satisfied with giving us the crumbs. Let me say that again. The good news is that in the overflow of mercy and grace that comes to us, first to the Jew, to God's chosen people from the hands of God, though we should be satisfied with the crumbs, he is not satisfied with giving us the crumbs. He has lavished grace upon grace, grace onto us. Beloved, do you believe this history, this foreshadowing of the coming church, the apostolic age, we, beloved, most of us, unless you are a Jew, are this woman. God's mercy and grace have grafted us into the tree, Romans 11, 17 through 18. We have no prior claim at the table of the Lord. We are but dogs looking for scraps. The children of Israel refused the gift of the Father to them, and the Father gave them that gift to us who have no claim on it initially. As the hymn goes, right? Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. Does the possibility of getting a crumb from God's table excite you or bring you resentment? You see, to receive Christ in faith, we must first understand the bad news. We don't deserve anything from God. Then you can receive the good news. But God has so lavished his love onto his people that we, the Gentiles, are able to receive more than the crumbs. We are offered a seat at the table through the blood of Jesus as true sons and daughters of God. This reality was not fully revealed to the woman that day. It could only be fully fulfilled in the release of the Holy Spirit. As it says in Galatians 3, Paul says clearly, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have now clothed yourself 
with Christ. Therefore, there is now neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. <laughs> Beloved, that's good news. We don't deserve that for a second. And you see, we should have, just like this woman, I'm okay with the crumbs. I'm okay with the crumbs. But God was not okay with just giving the crumbs. When we had no right to the crumbs. And we had no right to a seat at the table. But because of Jesus, because of his love that is unbounding for us, we are now Abraham's descendants. Heirs of the promise, true children of God are no longer merely by birthright. Rather, they are born again through faith. Food and people are not unclean. Rather, it is the heart that is unclean. Has your heart been washed? Has your heart been baptized? As it says here, if you've been baptized in Jesus, you will receive the promise. Church, we should never, ever, ever take advantage of the grace of God has given us. As soon as we defend our right to it, we look like the Pharisees and we reject Christ's message. Paul provides us with this warning from Romans 11. If some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, that's us, the Gentiles, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive tree, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, says Paul, but they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. That's a word for the church. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you. We are called to holy reverence, beloved, in the face of such grace. What a gift our Father has displayed. 1 John 3, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. So I ask you, how does this affect your worship? Are you crying out to Jesus in a similar way to how this woman did? Do you recognize your place before a holy God? You see, we should be zealous for the power of God. We should be righteously jealous and desire any crumb or morsel we can find from our Father. One crumb, beloved, has the power to flip this whole city on its head. Henry Blackaby, in his book, Experiencing God, he said, you find out what God is doing and join him. This is what the woman did. She saw the hand of God at work and desired to be near it in any way she could. Church, two facts remain. Steadfast, even in Kansas City North today. Jesus is at work. He's always at work. He's on the move and he's working around us through his Holy Spirit and through his servants. Have you seen? They're out there. Will we be like the Pharisees who struggle again and against him and deny what his will is? Or will we be like this Gentile woman and embrace him, knowing our place before him and follow him into whatever situation? Because, beloved, here's the truth. He says, if I didn't spare those branches, I won't spare you. God will pass us by. God will pass by the arrogant. He will pass by the legalist. He will pass by those who refuse to listen. Those with ears to hear, let him hear, said Jesus. He does not need us. God does not need us, but he invites us in. He invites us to be a part of it. He has shown us grace. What is our response then? But to return our bodies, this is in Romans 12, as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. We, as the church, have the greatest honor of being the means of God's reconciling plan to the world. We simply have to be willing and believe and say, yes, a crumb will do. If we do not, God will rise up another. God will not be thwarted. He will not be denied. Therefore, let us join in with the cry of this woman. Lord, just a crumb from your table is enough for me. Matthew 17, he says, truly, I tell you, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, the faith of a crumb, 
You can say to this mountain, move from here. And it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Amen, beloved? Amen. This is a good word. I'm nourished by it and hope you are too. Let's pray. Lord God, we receive your word. We receive what you have done for us, Lord. Your grace is gigantic. <laughs> We're drowning in it. And Father, we just receive it. We receive the breakers of grace, Lord. Let them pour over. Let them wash. Lord, bring your revival rain upon us, Lord. Wash this whole town, this city, and this nation, Lord. In your grace, may it be on display from every hilltop, Lord. May the light shine out in the darkness, proclaiming, Father, that you have provided a way. You have grafted us in. Lord God, we are so thankful. We have, we, why, why should we gain from your reward, Lord? I can't give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds, Jesus' wounds, have paid my ransom. Christ and him crucified. That's all I know. That's all we know. God, may that be all this church knows so we don't get caught up in anything else. Lord, Father, move through us, speak to us, use us. And Lord, we pray that you would be with us as we dine and commune with you in this moment. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. For those of you that have your communion with you, once again, there is a little wafer and then the juice attached. These are safe. They are safe to eat. Beloved, it's a joy to come together in communion. Jesus told us to do this, to remember him, and through this action, you're acting out truly what we believe about the gospel. Hear the words from the Apostle Paul. On the night that Christ Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take it and eat. Beloved, the body of Christ, take and eat all of it. In the same way, he took the cup. And as he poured it, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. The promise of Abraham's seed. Take it and drink it. For as long as you eat of this body and drink of this cup, you proclaim my coming until we eat of it again with him. Beloved, the blood of Christ. Take it in faith. pray. God, you're so good. We know you are with us, Lord. You are present here with us. Lord, may today be the true day, Lord, that people take this in faith for the first time and are transformed, Lord. May the statement ring loud and clear, Lord, as we celebrate with others the communion of saints in the highest heaven. Lord, we look so forward to dining with you and we thank you for a seat at the table. Christ. Amen. Let's sing our final song, the triumphant song. I'll build your kingdom here. The kingdom of the heavens is now advancing, beloved. Let's sing it like we mean it, okay? <laughs>
Church, go in the name of Jesus Christ, bearing his cross, bearing his authority, knowing who you are only in him, reliant upon his blood to save and to propel you by his spirit into the world from now until evermore when we join together at the table of the Lamb. In Jesus' name, go.
time, guys. Appreciate you. See you later, live stream.